Hey folks, Mike Shea here from slyflourish.com and twitter.com slash slyflourish. Hey, James Intercasso is already here. He's on the money. Just dropping in. Uh, today is a uh, another fine episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy Dungeon Master prep, uh, in which I go through the steps of the Lazy Dungeon Master and, uh, in preparation for my Tomb of Annihilation game, which is happening in one hour at my local game shop. Actually, an hour and a half. I'm leaving in an hour. It's about a half hour to get there. Uh, as we have in previous episodes, which you can find on YouTube, uh, we will go through all of the steps. Oh my God, Sam Dillon is here too. James Intercastle and Sam Dillon. It's like the whole Tome Show cast is sitting here. That's funny. I should put you guys on. I don't know if I knew how to do stuff like that, and I don't. Uh, I have two live guests, however, uh, Precious and Pumpkin. Pumpkin is underneath my chair right now playing with a zip tie. Very interested in that zip tie. Uh, I don't know where Precious is, but it's not. There is some probability that during this show, they will jump up to that thing behind me over there and um, fight. Uh, I think they fight for money, but it's like, it's like, uh, yeah, it's like no holds barred cat fighting. So um, we're going to go through the steps of the Lazy Dungeon Master while I prepare for my Tomb of Annihilation game. But also, we want to just chat about D&D. So hello to everybody in the Twitch chat. James James Intercasso, of course. Um, and uh, Sam Dillon is here. And Gondolar and other folks. Please, uh, Justin Bassett. So people are here. If you're not catching this live, these are all up on YouTube. Um, I don't know. If you're not catching it live, I don't know why I'd be talking to you because the only other way you would see it is on YouTube. So... These cats are trouble. Um, as we did, let's take a look at what happened in our last session's game. So these are my notes from the last session. Uh, the notes for this show are also going to go up on the YouTube notes page with hyperlinks and everything, so you can see it all there. Um, so last week was the last week where the party spent time in Chapter 2, exploring Cholt. Uh, after, I think, I don't know, probably like six months in real life of exploring Chult, they finally reached Omu. Uh, my group, actually quite interesting. It's very interesting. I, I'm, there's probably, I don't know, a sample size of two is probably too small. But both my groups chose the same paths, not only to get through Chult, uh, but also chose the same spot to enter Omu. Wow, my hair is some, all kinds of messed up. Um... So they um, they both chose to come in from the waterfall side rather than going down the great stair. They, I think they said, wow, there's a great stair that leads in there. <laughs> I bet there's an ambush there. So um, I think they switched over to, they both said, yeah, we're going to go like scale that waterfall. A little bit, you know, maybe a surprise. But that's perfectly fine. Uh, it just means that they will go through, uh, let's see if I can pull up my, my map of, uh, let's see, where are we going here? Uh, make sure. By the way, if any of my sound is not coming in right, if anything's weird, please, please let me know. Uh, map of Chol, map of Omu is what I'm looking for. Where's the map of Omu? There's the map of Omu. So let's open this in a new tab. And then we can zoom way in. Um, I don't want to quite zoom in that far. Uh, so up here is the waterfall entrance to area 17. Uh, the Great Stair is down here in Area 1. Uh, however, really, the whole city is uh, a nice, small sandbox. So I have no idea. Um, I know Sam Dillon actually ran Tomb of Annihilation, I believe, fully, and ran it in like uh, a small number of sessions. So he can probably sound off in the chat about how sandboxy and about how long you know, if, if time is not a factor, and for my group, it's not, we're, we're, we're enjoying, um, you know, we're just enjoying the game, however long it takes. Uh, I'm not, none of us are in any rush. So Sam, how long do you think it would take a group that is spending time uh, to go through Omu? And obviously, like the Fane of the Night Serpent can kind of interweave, I think, with Omu. Um, and I don't know which... Um, uh, which one of the puzzle cubes I'm going to have other group? I definitely have other groups pick them up. Like the Red Wizards are going to pick up a puzzle cube, and the um, uh, and of course the 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 
um, you know, you want to, will have picked up puzzle cubes. Uh, but I don't know how many, maybe only one or two. I don't know. I guess it depends on like how long are they like, man, we're so tired of these stupid, you know, trickster God puzzles. So, so we will see. Uh, quick recap on things that happened last week's game. Um, so they had the star goddess thing. I did try out. So now I have, so I was, I complained last week, the last couple weeks, and Sam can attest to this. Uh, he was, he probably caught both barrels of my, uh, all of the deep thoughts I've had about Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. And I, I was doing a review of Tome of Foes for the Tome show and also writing an article, which will be up this Monday on Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. So I read the book cover to cover and I spent a lot of time looking at the monsters, both in story and reading all the text, but also deeping, deep diving into the stats and stuff like that. And I had lots of thoughts and lots of issues. Uh, I think it's a fine book. I think it's it's got lots in there. The, many of the monsters are awesome. Uh, there's a few monsters that have me scratching my heads. And my big assessment is that high-level monsters are just not powerful enough. And uh, I was mildly justified by running a survey on my Twitter feed, which, of course... Um, so DM Samuel, uh, Sam Dillon, says that uh, they spent about seven to eight sessions in Omu alone. Uh, and that's how sandboxy it is because it's huge. But their group is on a deadline, so he had them only spend one session in there. Um, yeah, so I don't know if we're going to spend eight sessions. I mean, eight sessions is a lot of sessions. That's like, uh, what, 24 hours in Omu, 24 game hours in Omu. Um, man, they're never going to level because <laughs> I'm not I'm not leveling them until they're done. Um, I kind of am keeping their, their levels, uh, uh, you know, pretty flat just so that they don't go into the Tomb of Nine Gods at 16th level. Um, so anyway, yeah, I did run a, uh, obviously a highly selection biased survey on Twitter, but I did get a thousand responses, uh, about 600 responses of which were actually relevant to the question on whether high CR, high challenge monsters, monsters that are above CR 10, are they hard enough? And about three quarters of people, three out of four DMs who ran high level, according to the survey said they are not hard enough. And then about roughly a little bit less than a quarter said uh, they're just fine. And then there was a tiny percentage, about 3%, that said they are they are too hard. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. But I think, you know, I, I that's obviously, again, a flawed survey. And um, there are, you know, but it was pretty, I mean, it was big. It was a lot of people. Um, but it's people that followed me on Twitter or got it through retweets or something like that. So it's not a perfect mirror of uh the world of DD. and there may be many many dms out there who don't really aren't part of the online DD scene and um might be finding that those monsters are just fine i bet you that you know those numbers aren't that far off um and that yeah high cr monsters aren't aren't tough enough to challenge high level characters so it means there's lots of stuff we can do and i offer some recommendations on that anyway i don't know why was i talking about that um what does that have to do with anything that was going on here who knows? I guess I just wanted to talk about um, uh, Morning Canons again. But boy, Sam already heard me talk about it for about an hour and a half. So he's probably like, oh my God, is he still talking about Morning Canons? But I am kind of done with Morning Canons. I mean, I'm not done with it. I'm still going to use it. And it's a great book. But I'm done sort of reviewing it and deep diving. And now it's time to move on to new things like Tomb of Annihilation and, and other things that are going on. Uh, so our group is definitely going to um, take our time. We're not, we're not in any rush. Uh, my Sunday group is going to play... Uh, we'll, we'll switch over to, uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist when it comes out this, uh, fall. And, but my, my Wednesday group, who was also playing Tomb of Annihilation, we play tested that. So we're not going to play that again. I don't know what we're going to do. We'll figure it out. Maybe I, I was thinking of doing the second half of Out of the Abyss, which I've never done before. So they started, oh, I remember why. And it's because I threw the, uh, Yuanti Shadow Assassin at them, which is actually a reskinned, um, Black Abishai. Uh, which are the sort of fiendish black dragon style. They're, so there's these fiends, they're devils, that are either worshippers of and or protectors to Tiamat. And they all mirror the five chromatic dragon types, but they are sort of humanoid dragon, flying dragon things. You can see them on... Hang on, I'll pull up a picture here. Uh, da, 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 beyond. I love d d Beyond. Uh, so the Black Abishai was one that there's, there's a picture of a Black Abishai, um, pretty badass looking thing, if you ask me. And, and actually in play, it wasn't too terrible. I still don't think it's a challenge seven. It's more like a challenge four or five. Uh, but it was, it was pretty cool. Um, 
And essentially, it can drop a cloud, you know, sort of the equivalent of a cloud of darkness that it can move, uh, that it can see through, but nobody else can. So it can actually do stealth checks inside, so you can't even hit it. Uh, I've run this monster twice now as a Yuanti Shadow Assassin, and both times uh, the party was able to dispel the shadow on the first round, and then it was just a regular fight. But in one fight, it did critically hit somebody with its bite attack, uh, and I doubled the damage on 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 uh, uh, crits on monsters because um, I'm mean. So that was like 34 damage that it did to one person. Uh, uh, I still think that thing needs a backstab. Or some kind of sneak attack. Anyways, I did run it twice. That was fun. They got attacked by zombie gorillas. That was cool. And then the star goddess became their new sort of base of operations. And the idea here is if characters die. Oh, one thing I did that was fun is they were getting. Uh, I didn't have gorillas show up. I had hundred a hundred zombies, and the party was fighting the hundred zombies when they got attacked by the shadow assassin. But the fun bit was they were having you know like a hundred zombies is a lot of zombies, and they were trying to kill every single one of them. So I eventually said, okay, who's your surrogate character? Who's your who's your secondary PC that you're keeping on hand? to in case you die in Chult or in die in, in the Tomb of the Nine Gods. And they're all like, oh, I kind of had an idea, but I don't really have a character. I'm like, well, what was your idea? And they said Sorcerer. And I said, okay, Fireballs again. So I had like people, NPCs that were on the Star Goddess that were actually versions of the future characters in case someone dies. And they were throwing Fireballs and doing, you know, some big spells. And the funny bit there is they were using a lot of scrolls. And then the player's like, no, don't use all the scrolls. I want those. And they're like, no, we got to use these scrolls. So they had like scrolls for things to get rid of the 100 zombies. Um, so I, I kind of moved that a little bit further because 100 zombies is a lot of zombies. But it made sense for the story. It made sense that the Star Goddess is sitting there up in the trees and there's this huge zombie horde that's just surrounded it and they can't really get out. And the, the, the characters were the ones to be able to come in and break the line and sort of, uh, uh, you know, rescue the Star Goddess. And then it, the Star Goddess became their new um, their new base of operations. So now they sort of have a place that's close to Chult that they can have characters say, like, oh, if we have a character today, for example, who's joining in for one session. And um, a friend of mine, James Rouse, uh, who goes by Serp Serpentine Owl on Twitter, he's he's coming by. And um, he has a character, and we could just say, yeah, he was one of the guys that came on the Star Goddess. Like, the Star Goddess could just be full of characters that were on their way to go to Omu. Uh, but then the Star Goddess crashed because it was attacked by, um, it tried to fly over Omu and it got destroyed by gargoyles. I think that's in the adventure, I don't know. Um, as we have in previous times, let's take a look at what um, what secrets and clues came up. Uh, Merchant Princes sent multiple groups to discover what's going on. They did. The tomb is unlike anything else in Chult. It's nearly alien. I think, yeah, that's come across. Adventures in a tomb never come out. Yes. Uh, no one has seen a Sarek for decades. He came with a bundle and then left. That really didn't come up. Uh, Aserak has many such tombs all over the multiverse that did come up. Group of red wizards, yes. Numerous explorers, yes. Group of kobolds serves Aserak, but they don't even know who he is, yes. I don't know, that, so I, I take that back. They know about kobolds. Uh, they do know about Abana dwarves who helped Aserak build the tomb and serve him. The door to the tomb of the nine gods requires nine puzzle cubes. They did not get that. Red wizards like Aserak leave arcane obelisks. Uh, did they do that? I can't remember if they ran into something like that. I think they did. Yes, they did. Uh, so they, they ran into an arcane obelisk that was infused with energy and a one of those uh, creeper plants, the yellow musk creepers, had wrapped itself around this arcane thing and there were yellow musk zombies. So they actually fought more zombies. And I was like, oh my God, it's like zombie day. But they enjoyed it and it was a cool fight and the, the zombies were a lot of fun. The art, and, and they were like musk creeper zombies. So like their eyes and mouths were you know, eyes were gone and roots were sprouting out of their mouths and one had like flowers where his eyes should be. And it was very kind of, these plant zombies were really thematic and even though they were just kind of zombie types, um, they really enjoyed that. Um, so they did learn that the red wizards like Aserak leave uh, Arcane Obelisk. So they, a lot of secrets came out. Uh, only, th looks like three did not. Um, this is a common question, like how many secrets and clues from previous sessions actually took place when we run it? Um, because it's not uncommon that I will write all these notes up and then forget them. I keep doing this every time. I will forget my notes and then run without any notes at all. So um, so that's pretty funny. So today is Omu. Uh, I have one new character. Let's see. We're going to get rid of our strong start here. Um, scenes that take place. We will get rid of that. Secrets and clues. We will get rid of that. Da, da, da. This is. I'm just cleaning up a copy of what happened last time. Uh, monsters and magic items. Yeah, I don't think they're getting any new magic items anytime soon. Um, so the new character, 
Uh, give me a moment. My friend James sent me some info about his character. And he says, the name of the character is a Florgy, Log Logri, a forest gnome rogue. Here, let's just, we can just. Uh, copy that. And we will just paste. Talk about backstory. This guy's got more backstory than anybody else. But that's what the guy's got. Uh, sneaking, smart, and unfortunately went in picking pockets at a young age and was caught with his hands in the patch of greedy dragon Lord sorcerer. Luckily, instead of being blasted, the opportunity worked for the sorcerer is Ion Chult. Ah, maybe the sorcerer, the Dragonborn sorcerer, could be a red wizard. Secret red wizard. Uh, interesting. So that's kind of a cool story. We'll keep that in there. James always has great stories. Uh, let me save this, too. This is uh, 22. I have my mic in my face, so I can't actually see what I'm writing. Um, all right. Uh, so as we, uh, I keep giving the introduction over and over again, but I'm going to give it again. Oh, let's see what Dan, so Sam in chat has been talking about how he managed to get through, uh, um, I have a cat attacking my feet. Oh, well. Um, they investigated two shrines and got two cubes from those. This is uh, Sam Dillon who ran it in one session. I think his sessions are pretty big. Uh, investigated two shrines and got two cubes from those they were uh, that they knew were special. They then kept seeing snakes all over and grungs, and they all seemed to be going in the same direction. The grungs causing the players to get curious, so they started following the grungs, and they stumbled across a huge battle between grungs and yuanti. In the middle of the battle, they find a huge yuanti shaman is trying to place a bunch of the cubes in a particular setup to perform a ritual. They knew they needed the rest of the cubes, so they planned to get the cubes and stole them away from the ritual cast in the middle of the huge grung conflict, and they had to flee because now the Yuanti and the grung were after them. And as they're fleeing, the cubes in their, in their, in their possession acted like a compass and led them to the entrance of the tomb, and that happened in a six-hour session. That's a pretty cool way to do it. Obviously, yeah, pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty ingenious to have like a great big conflict that's going on. Um, that's a cool way to do it. Uh, I think, you know, an easy way, if anybody else is kind of looking for a way, uh, you know, and of course, a, that, a scene like that is very cool, like having two different conflicts and everything is great. You could also, like, I think the adventure is tuned so that you could basically have any number of the puzzle cubes picked up by either the Red Wizards or uh, the Yuanti. And then if the players deal with either group, they can get whatever cubes those guys had. So, um, you know, that's the, that's the sort of easy mode. And then you can expand that out into a bigger story if you want. Um, so, uh, my sump pump, we had tremendous tremendous rain last night and i thought my basement was going to flood and luckily it didn't my sump pump worked what my sump pump was going off why am i talking about my sump pump on a twitter channel about dnd um it was going off every minute for all night so that is a that piece of machinery deserves a medal uh so what is today's strong start so they're at the waterfall um and uh so one of the things I definitely want to have is um, I want to have the King of Feathers. So maybe they will see the King of Feathers. Um, uh, yeah, flooding. I've never, I don't think, so knock on wood, um, our, we've been here 11 years and it's never flooded. And uh, there's no sign that it ever has. Like looking at all of the woodwork in the basement, it, I don't see any water lines anywhere. And I think they checked for that. So I think our house is high enough above the water line that even in really bad states. And when we first got here, our sump pump actually stopped working. Uh, we had to get it fixed, but it didn't. I, I couldn't tell if it was going to flood or not. I think we're just above the water line, but it's scary. And that sump pump goes off like crazy during that. We just had so much water so fast, but no problems. Uh, so I have, I'm wondering, so the King of Feathers, right? And there's discussion. Let's see if we go back to our Forbidden City stuff. Uh, uh, area 13. Uh, so there's an amphitheater. Um, 50% of the King, King of Feathers at night decreases. Uh, That's pretty cool. So this is a thing. Um, it's a legendary 
Uh, probably, I bet you this thing could, should get legendary actions. Uh, I think I want to give the King of Feathers invisibility on top of all of its other abilities. Like, what if it has a little bit of psionics to it? And that's why it's so good. It, it kind of phases away. So it's like this giant predator. Um, and uh, maybe they see it. I wonder, you know, I wonder if they see it ahead of time. That that'll kind of freak it out or freak them out, right? So I think they see. And the group is there? Are there random encounters in um, in Chult specifically? Uh, I bet there are. Let's go back to Tomb of Annihilation. Omo encounters. Uh, cats are what is that? Cats are up to no good. Yeah, so I think I'll roll randomly. Yeah, here are the Omu encounters, and I think I will roll randomly on um, what group they see, and then they will see the um, the King of Feathers uh, destroy that group from afar. Like this will be, you know, they're on the waterfall looking out over the thing. And they will see the King of Feathers show up. Um, I think that will be a cool, a cool beginning to the scene. They don't necessarily need to start with a fight. Starting with a fight is not always a bad idea if you need to sort of wake everybody up so that you can also just sort of show things. And I think there's enough excitement going on, and I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, scenes that are going to take place. Uh... Oh, so let me go through the steps of the Lazy Dungeon Master, right? That's part of the reason why we do this. Uh, let me switch over to my other, so I have it up here. Uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is a book that I kickstarted earlier this year. Uh, we are getting closer and closer to production. We've got like three quarters of the art and the design is already done and the editing is already done and layout is, is mostly done until we get the other pieces of art. So uh, things are moving along well with this book. Uh, and Lazy, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master has a eight steps that you can go through for preparing your game. You don't need to do all eight steps if you don't want to. Um, Tabaxi hunters, yeah, yeah, bag of nails and everything. I kind of don't want the, the tabaxi hunters to just get their asses kicked, though. Um, I actually have a secret plan for the tabaxi hunters for my Wednesday game. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'll probably, I don't know. I, I kind of want to pick a group that won't be as exciting for the, um, you know, for the party to meet. So, we'll see. Ah, oh, kitties. They found a cap to a bottle, and it's the most exciting thing in the world. So there's eight steps. You don't have to follow eight steps. It, you, you choose whatever steps make sense and help you prep your game. Um, and sometimes you don't need them. Sometimes you don't need all the steps. But there's usually a couple that you need. And there's a couple that I that I highly recommend no matter what you're doing, whether you're running published or not. Um, I still think that they are they're highly important, um, that they are highly important steps. So... Um, Step one, review the characters. Who are the characters? What do they have? What, what's interesting? How can they, uh, how, how do their backgrounds tie into the story? How can we add new story elements that fit the characters? Stuff like that. Create a strong start. What is the game? How is the game going to begin? Um, I had, a, I had a, a great chance encounter meeting uh, Chris Perkins at Origins and talk to him about how he prepared for games that he's going to run in front of 4,000 people. And he said, I mostly figure out what, how it's going to begin. And, and I go with that. And then it goes off the rails from there. So for him, that was the number one step. That he that he followed, um, uh, so create a strong start. What where where is the game going to begin? Uh, outline potential scenes. Um, what scenes might occur? We keep these really loose. You'll see when we're going through it. But basically, we're just jotting things down so that in our mind we have a, a general idea of where things are going to go for a for a game like that. Um, this is one of the more skippable steps, but it's also a step that people do a lot. So I thought like, it's probably worth talking about and it does help. Like if you, if you're feeling like a game's out of control and you really don't know what's going to go on or it's really sandboxy and you want to be sure that it doesn't get boring, having a list of like, here are things that could happen and then being ready to throw them right away if things don't. Secret, secrets and clues. Uh, this is really the big reason that uh, this book, this new book exists, and it's because of how powerful secrets and clues are for all sorts of different games. I was looking through the Dungeon Master's Guide recently, and they actually have a variant of this for their discussion of how to run mysteries. 
they talk about having having clues and in particular having more clues than you potentially need because it's way better for the characters to find out things too early than it is for them to never find it out at all. So I kind of like that. Um, so secrets and clues are like one line bits of information, whether they're directly relevant to the to the story that's going on now or whether they're bits of history or character development or anything. And we write them out without knowing how the characters are going to find them. And, and that way we can improvise how they find them while the game is going on. Finding a, defining a secret and clue, uh, improvising a secret and clue is pretty hard, um, particularly if you don't have any. Um, but improvising how they find it is actually not hard at all. Like you can find it many, many different ways. Um, I ran a game yesterday. I ran my, my uh, Prince of the Apocalypse game yesterday and they found out all kinds of things by talking to like a guy. They met an NPC and the NPC turned out to be like the, the acolyte of a sage and he was like oh let me tell you all about the the bell the Be bezelmere dwarves and let me tell you about you know what the uh, mirabarian delegation was finding out about these weird places that are underneath and they were trying they knew something was going on they came here all he he, he kind of spouted off a whole bunch of them so you can have like one guy who has like all the secrets and clues um but sometimes they'll find him in other ways hey it's a mosaic on a wall that describes something or um you know, it's a, uh, one of them has a dream. I love kind of dreams and portents are, are a great way to reveal secrets. It's very easy. You can kind of do them at any point. You know, whoever's got arcane or divine, all of a sudden their eyes go weird and they have a vision. You know, it could happen. Oh, the cats are having such a good time. Today is our last day with these cats. Um, Precious and Pumpkin are going back to the shelter tomorrow to get fixed and then put up on the floor to get adopted, which is okay because they're killing my, they're killing my wife. She's got allergies and, um, She's the one that brought him here, by the way. It's not like I brought cats and I'm killing my wife with cats. Um, she loves the cats. And um, uh, is that, that line looks weird. Huh. I guess it's just the way it renders. So um, develop fantastic locations. Uh, fantastic locations are another... Um, uh, another thing that are hard to improvise. Uh, luckily for a published adventure, we usually have that. So... Um, uh, um, we don't usually have to come up with a bunch of fantastic locations. We can usually, um, we usually have them on hand, but sometimes if they're exploring and it's like the jungle, that's when we use our random cholt, uh, you know, monument generator to kind of say like, Hey, we found an old tomb to, you know, the, uh, there's an old tomb for, um, whatever tabaxi hunters. Sorry. I'm picking up from chat. The tabaxi built tombs for themselves. And you're like, Oh, that's kind of an interesting thing to find. And then they could learn something. There's all kinds of things they could do. Um, Cats chewing on electric cord. Uh, important NPCs. If we have NPCs that are important for us to note, particularly the names of NPCs when we forget them, uh, this is our chance to write them out ahead of time so that we uh, have them ready. Uh, again, we don't always have to have the NPCs. Sometimes secrets and clues will already have the NPCs wired in. We don't really need them, but sometimes it's handy. Uh, relevant monsters. If we don't really have any idea what kind of monsters are going to show up, it, it behooves us to spend a little time figuring out the ecology of the area and then jotting down the names of the or the types of monsters that might show up. Um, it's a handy thing to do. Magic item rewards. Players love magic items. They are a major part of a character development, and yet we DMs don't spend a lot of time on, time on them, so it's worth spending time to figure out what magic items they should have. Particularly, what do they have now? What do they want in general? And then are there ways for us to kind of add new items in? Um, both my groups are pretty well you know, decked out in magic items. So I'm, I'm not worrying about it so much now. And every so often I'll throw a random magic item in there. Uh, somebody just got a bag of tricks, uh, a, a gray, I think a gray bag of tricks by just pure randomness. And it is actually a very cool. Um, ah, so Justin Bassett asks me about artist Simber. Artist is like this weird, you know, he's, he comes up a lot. Artist Simber is an NPC in tomb of annihilation. That is a super high powered NPC who carries around a Holy Avenger. And um, there's he's like an important story tie uh, in it. But And I had rumors of him early on, and then I just kind of forgot about him, and so did the players. So I have not had him show up. And everybody that I know that has had him show up wishes he hadn't because he's so game-breaking. Like, he's just running around blasting things. And it, it kind of he kind of can upstage PCs if you bring him into the game itself. So I was going to bring him in and have him kind of off to the side. Uh, this group did find giants, but um, and I forget. I, 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 oh, I think uh, James Intercasso on a recent uh, episode of uh, Tabletop Babble had DM tips with um, Lisa Chen and um, Johnny Four, right? 
And uh, I can't remember who brought it up. Maybe it was Lisa that said, um, you don't need to tie off. Maybe, I think it might've been Johnny. You don't need to tie off every thread, right? We always have this idea of like, oh, well, they discovered this in episode two. We ne definitely need to bring it back in episode nine. You do not. You do not need to bring it back up. Um, it, you know, the world has loose threads in it and it's perfectly fine to have loose threads that never really get tied back. You know, you kind of want to find out if there are important loose threads for characters that, that players are like, I really wanted to find out what happened with that. But sometimes you can say, well, what do you, you know, what do you think happened, right? And, or just let your imagination go with what happened. And, and you know, loose threads are, loose threads are okay. Uh, there was a really interesting study and I don't have the, like the research in front of me or anything like that. And I heard about it on a podcast, but I, I'm pretty sure it is true. Um, that they surveyed a bunch of people watching movies and they, um, they did a control group of people that watched a movie and then rated the movie. And then they had a test group that watched the movie and then they said, oh, there's something wrong with the projector and we can't show you the last 15 minutes of the movie. And those people said that they had a high degree of frustration, but they liked the movie better than the people who actually saw the whole thing. They rated it higher. So that idea that there are loose threads that we don't fill in could potentially mean that their game is more interesting because of our headcanon. That headcanon can fill in a lot and our own headcanon is often better than whatever any author or even a game can run. So keeping threads open is, is not, not bad. Um, so that's about Artist Simber. Uh, so that's the, hey, look, art in that cool piece. Um, so that's the steps of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Uh, let me jump back to uh, our notes here. And then uh, I can minimize that. So we have, yeah, we're going to see the King of Feathers destroy another group. That'll be fun. Uh, Descend of the Waterfall. They're probably going to hit the first tomb. Um, let's go back to. Uh, let's see. Jump to. No, this is not what I want. Hold on. Locations in the city. Oh, my head, my headphones are about to fall. What do you want? What are you doing down there? What are you doing? What's going on down there? Cats. Um, so they're going to go to uh, 16 is highly likely. They're going to see 17, 16, and maybe 15, right? So those are probably the three. Again, they might go in different directions. Uh, 17 is the waterfall. We have that. Oh, the, the, the vision, right? We want to have the vision. I think they already had that. Uh, I think they already had the vision where they saw the city and then they saw it burn. Um, and what did I say? 17, 17, 16, 15. Uh, and I've run this one before. Papazotl. Oh, that reminds me. I have to print out the handouts. Holy cow. Let me do that right now. Um, there is... The player handouts. Uh, I will stick these in the show notes. Let's see. Da, da, da. I almost forgot. Uh, I don't need all of these. Uh, but I need page eight onward, right? Print page eight onward. All right, print seven sheets of paper. Printer is online. Oh, lights dimmed. I have a laser printer and use a lot of power. Um, uh, Visions of a Serac. So, uh, sorry, loud, loud printer. Um, print these handouts, man. They're, they're useful. Uh, also, one thing I recommend, uh, I'll have a trick. Uh, I went to Kinko's slash FedEx printing, and I got 11 by 17 printouts of the major maps for um, Tomb of Annihilation, including Omu and Port Nyanzaru and Cholt itself. And they're nice and big, and they're about, like, 20 cents each. They're way cheaper than getting a bigger poster map. Poster maps can be, like, 20 bucks. So if you're okay with 11 by 17s, which are pretty decent, like they're, they're enough that a group of people can sit around it and look, um, that's a good, that's a good approach. So 
Oh, I just banged my mic. Sorry. Oh, here comes a kitty. Um, my printer streaks, but good enough. So I have my printouts. I just have to remember to bring them. Um, hello, kitty. Hello. Kitty's got an eye problem, I think. Both our cats got eye problems in every one of their eyes, and it would switch. So it's like Precious would have one eye that had goopy stuff, and then the other eye, and then the other eye would be fine, and now Pumpkin's got one eye going. Come here, you. Uh, come here, kitty. But that's why we've been hanging on to him. There's kitty. Hello, kitty. Hello. See, he's all blinky. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, okay. Up under the perch. Um, what the hell is I talking about? Uh, places they're going. So, Papazotl Shrine. Um, uh, totally not spelling that right. Papazotl. No, I spelled it right. Yay, me. Uh, and then I think there's one other shrine that they might hit. Uh, 15? That looks likely. They might try to get down to 20. Um, uh, uh, 15 is the ruined bazaar uh, with kobolds, right? That might be an interesting NPC. And then 20 is the palace ruins, right? Um, I mean, it's possible they could get right involved with... Uh, um, Um, 20 is the Iwanti area, right? So they could get directly involved with uh, the Iwanti. That's a possibility. Uh, so secrets and clues. This is the hard part of our game prep. I think my thing's falling. Sorry, I'm banging it around. Um, this is the hard part. Oh, let's see if anything's going on in the chat. Ah, oh, people like the cats. Yeah, who doesn't like a cat? Is the cat still up there? No. Now they're drinking. Um, secrets and clues are probably the hardest part of prep. Like, I think that reviewing the characters, the strong start, and secrets and clues are the ones that really have to be done. And the fantastic locations should be done if you really don't have anything. If you're not running a published adventure or you already don't know what your locations are. That's important, too. And then the other ones you can kind of fill in as you need. And most of the, again, the whole purpose of this whole checklist is do I feel comfortable enough to run a game? Right? Am I, do I feel confident and I'm ready to sit down and go, bang, here's, we're playing D&D. That's why we do this. And you should only do the things that you need to do in order to feel that way. Um, so high step back history. No one's ever late. You, you arrived precisely when you mean to. Uh, secrets of clues for the characters on cover. Um, let's see. Do you want to seek the puzzle cubes and already have... Um, I like the idea that the King of Feathers is psionic, you know, that it can do these like psionic things like it can teleport or it can misty step around and it can, um, uh, uh, you know, it has these sort of psionic abilities. And who knows, I might improvise some psionic abilities, you know, that maybe it can shield, uh, it can make itself invisible, um, you know, it can do cool things. Do you think it's cool if one member of a party really likes a movie and you want to make an adventure loosely based off that plot? Or is that ga gauche? Uh, no, I think that's cool. I, I wrote a whole adventure that's basically a retelling of uh, John Wick uh, in one of the adventures in Fantastic uh, Adventures is based on John Wick. Um, I think it's fun to take the plot and then sort of twist it a little bit, have the villains slightly different or, you know, take, you know, what, uh, what element can you mix, can you mix in that sort of turns it on its head so that whoever is playing, you know, whoever is seeing the movie can go like, oh, so that's not true. Right. Or, wow, that's, that's different. The, you know, the villain, the, the person they think the villain isn't the villain and the person who is the villain is not mysteries are tough, but, you know, kind of turning things around, um, is a, is a good way to do it. Um, in my John Wick adventure, um, it was a priestess. Uh, she was this like relatively low-level priestess of an elven priest of, of an elven order 
Um, but about a hundred years ago, she had been like the best assassin for um, these group of elf, elvish assassins uh, known as the Black Rose. Um, there's Kitty again. Hello, Kitty. Hello. Um, and uh, Ghoulies. I don't know the movie Ghoulies. Sorry. I can't help you there. I know Gremlins. Um, yeah, so, you know, woman was or this elvish woman was trying to um uh you know repent for her ways she murdered kings you know she was a king slayer and, and did all this stuff and now she just wanted to be a priestess in this little out of the way town and just live the rest of her existence as a, as a mid-level priestess and then these punk ass rich kids come and pee in their pool like literally pee in their fountain and the rest of the priestesses are like oh the kids and the kids get away with it because they're a bunch of rich kids and she's like, no, they're not going to freaking get away with this. And then she goes and hires like other mercenaries and they go in and then she says like, you're going to give me that kid or I'm going to start murdering every, you know, every rich person in this town. And then um, they're like, wow. And so the, the party's goal is to try to find her. Her name is Gloom. And uh, they have to they have to figure out where she is. Um, so that was a bit of a mystery. And the whole thing is like she's kind of doing things while the party's figuring out who she is. Fun stuff. But it was all based on John Wick because I like the movie John Wick. I think I bet you that's not the only. Oh, uh, there will be blood. Um, there's another adventure in um, uh, Fantastic Adventures that's based on the movie There Will Be Blood. The characters are all based on There Will Be Blood. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing I do, and this is a trick. James Henry Castle, I think, also mentioned this trick, which is um, one, one, one fun way to kind of change things is switch the genders. So villains that are, you know, so John Wick became a, a female elven priestess and in There Will Be Blood, uh, the character that was played by, uh, what's his name? I can't remember, you know, best actor ever, um, was a female who's also like the super driven female that just wants, she just wants to pull this, there's this substance down under the earth that seems to be seeping out and it's really powerful stuff and she wants to get it. And even though people are turning into undead and even though there's this like this, you know, strange cult that showed up, she's like, whatever, I want the party to come in and take care of that, but I still want to be pulling stuff out of the ground. That was all based on uh, There Will Be Blood. So yeah, using movie plots are great. And you're just like, what's the twist? You know, what's the what's the movie plot twist? And, and if the, tw the twist is good enough and when you do things like switch the genders of the characters, they don't know. Like the players are like, wow, this is cool. I have no idea. I bet you there's not many people who played um, Gloom and figured out that it was uh, John Wick. Um, we, th we would think it's immediately obvious, but they, they think it's not, uh, we need more secrets. Uh, what are the secrets? So the interesting thing about the kobolds is that means they would know, you know, they probably know very little. Um, what other secrets and clues exist in, uh, let's see. I love this idea that the tomb is totally different than everything else around it. Like the, the shrines are like these nice fun puzzles, but none of them are like you are then crushed by a giant brick for 44 damage. And if it takes you to zero, you're immediately killed. Um, my sump pump went off again. It's probably going off every 20 minutes. We had so much rain. Uh, what other secrets and clues? Uh, yeah, the DMs don't, uh, the kobolds don't know how much they know. Uh, because what they think they know, they, they, they know what they think they know what's important. Um, is there a conclusion to all the studying and, and of challenge ratings of Morgan Kenny's bosses? Step back history. Yes, I will. I will. I will. Um, give me a give me a second. Let me finish another secret and clue and I will get to how to do it. Um, I do have, I think, a pretty decent solution um, and it's pretty easy to do. Yeah. Uh, Maybe, uh, hey, uh, Sam, do you know what my tips are for how to deal with the challenge rating of Morden Kanan's bosses? And if so, you can post it there. Um, if you don't, I'll remind you in a bit. It's pretty easy. Uh, there is a what? Oh, my God. I forgot what I was going to say. Nothing is like the tomb below. Oh, a rift. Uh
uh, yeah, the, the Yuanti here. Let's go. Who's the uh, Fenthaza? The cat, I, my, the cat, I hear this like scratching noise and all of a sudden my keyboard kicked out. Um. This is a fun little side quest that uh, is character driven. One of our characters is uh, sort of a loose avatar of um, the uh, uh, what's that tribe? Uh, the uh, the Ashodo, uh, who's like this. Hello kitty. Hello kitty. Hello kitty. Juggling kitties. Um. Uh, he is the avatar of the Ashodo, and I have it that the Ashodo is the only thing that can open up the doors to get to um, the Night Serpent. Um, uh, so they fear him. Like the Yuwanti are kind of in awe of him. Um, and they want him because if they can bring him to the doors, he can open the doors to release the Night Serpent, which is like my 20th level dungeon you know, in my mind, I don't know what the hell is there, but I know it'd be like this crazy shadow world of weird mysteries and huge eldritch horrors and whatnot. And it'd be really bad if it opened. So that's a fun story. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I need two more, two more secrets. Uh, what else can we have? We got the Yuanti. Um, I think that I already had that the, uh, oh, Uh, some secret in a PC backstory. Let's take a look at that. So let's let's kind of review the characters again. Smoke, the Tabaxi Ranger Rogue. I asked about his backstory, and I can't remember what he told me because I'm an idiot, and I didn't write it down. Um, Gabriel Tharmond. Um, uh, so Gabriel was a character who died, and Tharmond's soul was put in Gabriel's body, so he kind of has two different sets of memories. And he sometimes has visions of things that are going on inside the tomb. So, um, whoops, what was that? So Tharmon could have a, th a, um, a vision of the Tomb Guardians. Uh, I think that would be pretty. He's actually seen, he's seen a little bit of that. He's seen, um, oh, I want to have something about the, uh, the sisters, right? One thing that I think is kind of funny is they have the three sisters and they have nothing to do with Nanny Poo Poo, who's also a hag. So we have like four hags in this adventure. Um, I don't know how to draw their connections. Um, Uh-oh, did my camera freeze? Uh-oh, hang on. Hang on, everybody. Cat, cat, unplug the USB plug. What are you doing back there? Cats. Cats, cats, cats. <laughs> Live fix and video feed. I don't know what happened. Is my audio still coming in? My audio is coming in, but the, the camera is not. That is bizarre. Oh, what a hassle. Let me try plugging it in again. Who 
It's been, you know, the cat's very interested in watching what's going on there. All right. Uh, I am going to, you know what? Tell with the camera. No one needs to see me anyway. I could restart it, but then all my video gets weird. So you'll just have to suffer with a frozen image of me. Uh, but that's not important because all of the other notes that are here are important. I blame the cats, but at least the audio is working okay. I know the beautiful cats, but the alternative is I have to restart the stream, which then restarts the video, and then I got to post two videos to YouTube or splice them together, and that's more work than I want to do considering I have 10 minutes left. So there's these these sisters, right? The three sisters of Aserarach, um, and they... Um, they're they're not sisters of Aserach. They're they're night hags, um, but they don't have anything to do with Nanny Poo Poo. And I don't know. So maybe the three you know three sisters. I like the idea that Nanny Poo Poo is not really dead. So maybe Nanny Poo Poo will show up. This might be a fun scene. Um, she might show up in a vision and just look at the characters like, you guys are such idiots, you know? Like, you think I'm bad? Wait till you see the sisters that are down there. They're so much worse than me. You know, that might be fun. Um, so fantastic locations they can explore. I don't really have to add anything here because I have all these kind of shrines. So I'm just sort of going to grab these three just so I have something in there. Uh, NPCs they might they might meet. Um, I like Bag of Nails. I think that the Tabaxi Hunters... Um, Is it Tabaxi or Tex Abbey? I always get them mixed up. I'm sure it's Tabaxi. Um, probably need a kobold. Do we have a kobold name generator? Um, Quigme. Quigme is a fine name. We'll go with Quigme. Uh, Uh, is there a kobold name generator? Oh, yeah, it probably is. Why don't we do that? Let's let's use books we paid for. Compendium, rules, volos, kobolds. Kobolds, little dragons. <laughs> Kobold names, Hawks, Meepo. Isn't there a Meepo already? They shouldn't use the name. Um, Taklak. I will stick with Quigme. Those are pretty cool. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about the monsters they face. It'll be random. So I'm not going to actually select. Most of them are in the... Um, you know, in the book, I don't really need to do uh, add any extra monsters because I already know everything's so well refined in the adventure, and we're going to be doing random encounters that I don't need to spend much time on this. And the same goes for magic items; they'll find whatever happens to be in the adventure. I don't need to do anything special for those. Um, so I'm going to leave those to blank. Just so we have note completion. Um, so that's pretty much it, right? These are these are all of the notes that I need for today's session. Again, because it's Omu, and I, Sam, I don't know if you felt the same way I did. I don't feel like I have to do as much work in this area other than reading it, which I did do, um, because uh, um, now I'm going to be smart and mail it to myself right now. Uh, so that I've got my game notes handy. Um Uh, I'm going to wrong windows. Wow, still the wrong window. I've got too many windows open. Um, I don't feel like uh, I have to do as much work um, because there's so much already built, right? There's so many. There's so much already built out that I think I think it kind of works fine. Um, and therefore, it's mainly just you know tying it to the characters and stuff like that that I want to do. And and I, again, secrets I think are always useful. Secrets I, I use all the time. Um, Yeah, so uh, Sam said that when he knew they were only going to do two shrines, 
um, that meant that he really, it was much more focused. He didn't really have to worry about it. And in, our, in my case, it's going to be more than a few shrines. So the most important thing is reading the book and knowing what's going to happen in Omu. And I've even read it a couple of times at this point, about one and a half times, and I, I really should get through all of it. And especially since they seem to be coming from the you know northeast instead of the southwest, the numbers are all reversed, so I should really read that. But I have been through it once, and it won't be too difficult. And the players don't mind too much if I have to stop them. Like, give me a second. I just want to read up and make sure that I'm getting this right, especially for the crazy-ass puzzles that are taking place. Uh, one trick, so my other group actually did get through a puzzle, and... Um, one thing I noted is that the puzzles can be pretty hard. So you want them to spend some time figuring out a puzzle, but then you can also give them intelligence checks to see, like, you think there's a connection between the letters and the blocks or something like that. Um, uh, let's see. Sam said, and knowing what, what info they need to have in order, uh, what info they need and have four to five ways to get that inf information to them. Yeah, right. Um, Sam, what would you say are the inf is the information that you actually need when you get to Omu? I mean, obviously, they need to know that they got to get the puzzle cubes. They need to know that these are the key to get into the tomb. They need to know that there's other groups that have them. Um, yeah. So Justin asks, what info from Omu is mandatory before moving on? That is a that is an excellent question. While he's answering that, uh, step back history. You uh, you had a question earlier about Morden Canaan's. Um, uh, conclusion to all the studying on, of challenge rating and Morden Canyon's bosses. My, my conclusion is that, so, you know, 80% of Morden Canyon's, 90% 90, 90 of Morden Canyon's is absolutely fine. Um, and the 10% that's not is really the statistics of high challenge rating monsters, some high challenge rating monsters, mostly the named demons and devils and stuff like that. They're really powerful ones. And in my opinion, and in the opinion of apparently many DMs, uh, they're too easy. So the tricks are, if you want to stay legal, you can maximize their hit points, which makes them significantly harder to beat. Um, that usually increases their hit points by about 150, by about 50% more. Um, and you can increase their damage up to their damage dice. That's not really legal. Screwing with their damage isn't really legal. Um, you know, you'd stick into the average is, is better um, if to stay legal, but I, it's just not going to be enough damage in my opinion. So um, to me, the hardcore mode, and I bet you that the hardcore mode is still beatable, but will be much tougher is double the hit points and double the damage. So whatever hit points and damage they're doing, just double it. Another trick is maybe give them more actions so that like, um, I was looking at Demogorgon because it's like, well, Demogorgon should be really, really hard. And the idea that Demogorgon can either make tentacle attacks or a gaze attack on his turn, and he only gets two legendary actions, um, I would give him a gaze attack on his turn for free. I would let him make two tentacle attacks and a gaze attack. And with the recognition that he should spread them out, like not have him just beating the crap out of one person. But, you know, he should be doing tentacle attacks on guys that are close and then gaze attacks on people who are far. And you remember, they're going to make some of their saves, although his saving throw DC is really, really high. Um, so more actions, doubling hit points, double damage. The other trick is I think a lot of... There's one spell in particular that I think can make these guys... Um, uh, you know, much less challenging, and that's Hero's Feast. Uh, I talked to Sam about this on the chat. That um, Hero's Feast in specifically negates fear and negates any poison damage or poison effect. And and creatures like uh, Hudigen, like half of their power comes from fear and poison. Uh, and the Drow, like tons of their stuff comes from poison. So uh, a way to deal with that, there's a couple ways to deal with that, but one is you can change it to necrotic or acid, you just change the damage type to one that isn't quite as easily removed. And then necrotic and acid stuff will, will still, you know, resistance is that will still matter. Um, that's one way. Uh, another trick that I learned was that the, to, to cast uh, Hero's Feast requires a thousand gold piece gem inlaid bowl. You know, there aren't many of those gem inlaid bowls in the world. So you might say like they only have two. And they only get it for two days, you know, and they got to pick which day they're going to use it. And they might not know they're going to fight a bunch of drow or they're going to fight Hootagen. So they might not cast that spell. You just want it so that it's not like every day they cast Heroes Feast. And what I, I know that when I didn't worry about the bowl, um, one of my players just said, I'm going to make Heroes Feast. I'm going to cast it every day, right? It's a fantastic spell. It's like the most powerful six level spell in the game. I don't know if that's true, but it's really, 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 really good. And um, my player said, I'm just going to mark it off. And every day we're going to do Heroes Feast. Right, and that meant that any green dragon is totally useless. It meant that anything that where fear or poison is a major part of their challenge, that that part of the challenge is removed. So, um, yeah, so doubling hit points, doubling damage, um, giving extra actions uh, to to give them those those you know give them let them really try things out, especially if there's more than four characters. 
James, uh, James Onicasso rightly brings up that most of the time groups are bigger than four. And when you have more than four, those, those stats are going to go out the, like the challenge ratings are going to go out the window. Um, oh, add more monsters, you know, they don't have them fight alone. So if you're fighting Demogorgon, you might be, you know, Demogorgon and two Goristros, right? Or Barler, Barlergras, Barlergras, um, you know, uh, let them, let them face that kind of stuff. Um, and all of that. So tomorrow morning, my article on Morden Canons will be out and it has a whole section about what to do about boss monsters that are in there. So you can, you can read up there. And, and the main thing is like, it's kind of done, right? It's printed. So there's no fixing it other than, um, us fixing it. And the nice thing is I think there are ways for us to fix it. And, you know, we DMs love tweaking stuff anyway. So for most of us, it's not going to be a big deal to kind of take a look at it and say, Ooh, you know, what if I do this and that and the other? Uh, so I want to go through what DM Samuel said. He said the information that's vital to know in Omu, and this is good for me too. The group needs to know one to look for the cubes, that the cubes are in the shrines, that kobolds, grungs, and tabaxi are already in Omu and may have clues about where the tomb entrance is, that Ross Nisi has a stronghold and that he's looking for sick cubes, that the red wizards are maybe around and they're also looking for cubes, uh, various different facts about the nine gods, depending on who they're talking to and about which cube they want. Um, and uh, letting him give clues to the specific um, uh, specific clues required to get through the shrine's puzzles. Um, Evil Twin Mason says, want to hear what the new D&D &D setting is going to be? And I have already seen that it is spoiled on Twitter. So uh, I don't know if it's a spoiler, really. Like, hell, we're going to find out one way or the other. Um, but I did see something about it. And uh, uh, I forget what it is. Ravnica that they're doing a Ravnica, um, let's see if I can, where's the link to it? I can't find it, but a bunch of people were talking on my Twitter feed about it and they said that it was Ravnica. Uh, so that's interesting. Let's see, paste this in there. If you didn't want to know, sorry. I don't know why you wouldn't want to know. So, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Cool cover. Badass. Yeah, Evil Twin Mas uh, Mason posted as well. So, that's not an official announcement. It could be a giant denial and deception campaign done by Wizards of the Coast, but I don't think so. You know, nobody makes a cover. Look at that. That cover's pretty great. You know, probably a good idea for them to connect magic to... Uh, if you're not a magic person, you probably haven't heard of Ravnica. Uh, there are a bunch of people who play Ravnica, and this might be a way to kind of draw them in. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, uh, it's certainly not what people I know are really dying for, which is um, how to, uh, uh, you, know, they, you know, Planescape or some other older campaign would be good. So it is past 11 o'clock, 1130, and I've got to run off to my game. Uh, sorry that the camera kicked out. I blame the cats. Uh, and I thank you all for hanging out today and talking about D&D. Thank you for letting me spend the morning with you getting prepped for my game. And uh, next week, I'll tell you how it goes, and we'll prep for the game after that. So have a great day. Enjoy enjoy some D&D. &D. Hang out on Twitter. Maybe watch a stream. If you can't, if you can't play, watch a stream. And uh, I will talk to you guys next week. Thank you all very much.